Hey, J.D. here. Welcome to the Mead House. You know, over the past several years, we've brought you over 150 episodes of mead-making education, information, and entertainment. More than 100 guests have stopped by the Mead House, professional mead makers, medal-winning home mead makers, competition organizers, experts on yeast and honey, and brewers just like you and me have all visited to share their knowledge. Hey, the Mead House is produced for home mead makers and brewers looking for a bit of inspiration and information from the many guests and discussions we have here at the house. You can help support the Mead House by joining the Mead House Keyholder Club on Patreon. Just go to patreon.com and search for the Mead House. There's also a link in the show notes. For as little as two bucks a month, you can become a key holder. We've teamed up with some great companies to provide thank you gifts for your support. So get on over to Patreon, join the Mead House Keyholder Club, and get your own set of keys to the Mead House. You can listen to the Mead House podcast with your favorite player, and be sure to rate us five stars on iTunes or your favorite listening venue, the Mead House. Mead making entertainment you just don't want to miss. All right, here we go. We're rolling. Hey, welcome to the Mead House, and thanks for listening to Ep- you, you know, I've been going on about this for the last couple of episodes. I cannot believe that we're on episode 176. We did 175 last week. I mean, 176 episodes in the can here at the house. I'll tell you what, that that has got to be like an all-time milestone uh, for everybody here. Ryan joined us uh, just shortly after uh, Mississippi Chris. And, uh, uh, of course, Jeff has been with me since the very beginning. He and Aaron Martin and Mississippi uh, helped uh, start to show up. Ryan came along. Ryan was actually a guest on the show. And he went on and on and on about something. I don't remember what it was. Ryan, do you recall what it was he was talking about? Or why we even uh, had you on the show? <laughs> yeah, I think it would be funny to go back and listen to it. Um, <laughs> it was some sort of a braggart. I think I think I was talking about a braggart that I made. Um, <laughs> Probably. Right off the bat, if I don't, if, if I recall correctly. Yeah, what right. else are we talking about? Yeah, I don't know. I can't remember. I, I have mean, to go back and listen. Fitting. Yeah, I'd have to go back and listen to the show myself. But anyway, it probably was Braggit, uh, something around a Braggit. Uh, and uh, I mean, you know, if you listen to the show since then, you know that we're kind of all about Braggits here. It's one of my favorite beverages in the mead category. But hey, again, thanks for uh, listening to episode number one seventy six. You know, I was just. Hanging a new ceiling fan when Jeff and Ryan showed up. I'm J.D. Webb, and I'll probably have to replace the carpet in the basement after the... Wait a minute. Do we even have a basement? I don't know about that. Cellar. Cellar. I'm sorry. I'll probably yeah. have to replace the... And it, why, why would it be carpeted? <laughs> why is there carpet in the cellar? <laughs> I, I don't know. Anyway, I'll probably have to do that after they leave. But hey, does anybody know where you can listen to the Meat House podcast? I do. How about on iTunes, Stitcher Radio, Spotify, iHeartRadio? I need to pre-record this little piece and throw it into the to the uh, recorded session, so I just you know click a button and just play it. Uh, but hey, we're on uh, YouTube. We're now on Amazon Music. So go tell your woman, uh, like, uh, what's her name? Alexa, 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 <laughs> Alexa, play the Meat House podcast, honey. I tell you what, check the front page of the website, themeathouse.com, for more locations. Hey, in this episode, when you know what? I was, I was 12 years old when I shared my first beer with my dad after helping him mow the lawn one Saturday afternoon and uh, never went to college. So apparently, I missed out on some of the best beer drinking of my life. Our guest this episode wanted to brew beer after college. He's not the first one on our show with that desire. So I guess I missed out on a whole beer drinking culture. But instead of beer, he got excited about mead. He's going to tell us why. We'll be talking to home mead maker Greg McNulty in this episode. Hey, in segment two, I ran across, uh, and this has more to do with Facebook friends than anything, but I was doing a little homework, doing a little research, getting the stuff ready for the Facebook friends uh, segment. And uh, this is going to be in Jeff's wheelhouse. We've talked about this more uh, 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 a while back on the show. Uh, There was a question, Jeff, about making Viking blood mead. Now, I know that this is not like 
it's, it's you know it's, it's it's not like your traditional just throw the honey in the water and the yeast in the in the you know in the can and let it rip. Uh, there's a lot more going on with the Viking's blood. I mean, mm-hmm. and it's, it's a little of, bit more in that Polish style, if I'm not mistaken. Yes. Yeah, and so we're going to talk about that a little bit tonight. Uh, I think it's worth discussing because you know we haven't talked about it that much and in that much detail on the show. So I thought it'd be worth a discussion here tonight. It also happens to be my wife's favorite mead. So go figure. Uh, and then uh, also, this might be up in Ryan's wheelhouse. Uh, this is another question that I saw posted on a Facebook board uh, about pasteurizing honey uh, and to trying to kill some of that wild yeast uh, uh, that may, uh, uh, you know, uh, produce some off flavors, that kind of thing. We'll talk about that in segment two as well. And then, of course, segment three. Hey, this is where Facebook friends and Reddit friends come into play. And uh, it's where we try to answer questions uh, from meat makers with no formal expertise other than what we have experienced in our own brew house. But all together now, all that and more here at the Meat House. But first... Want to do that again? Ready? All together now. All that and more here at... Never mind. All right. Hey, thanks all, <laughs> <laughs> thanks to all the Meat House key holders uh, who uh, help keep the Meat House podcast free. You too can become a Meat House key holder. You know, I played this thing at the beginning, the very beginning of the show. Uh, you know, like way in the beginning. But before you even hear us start talking this place. But anyway, worthy of... Uh, it's worth doing it again. So... Hey, yeah, you too can become a Meat House key holder and uh, help support the show for as little as two bucks a month. We've got some great thank you gifts. You know, I'm going to let the cat out of the bag here a little bit. Well, not the whole cat, just a little bit. We're working on something right now, listeners, that's going to knock your socks off. And uh, to, you know, how do I put this, Jeff, without the whole cat clawing its way out of that gunny sack? Um, we're not. <laughs> This is like this. This is a key holder thing. This is all about the key holders. This, this, I think we're going to start mm-hmm. there, uh, and we're working on this deal that we're going to add to. We're going to add to the tiers, right? In Patreon, yep. please up. Yeah, and Ryan. Sweet nut pot. Yeah, Ryan. Uh, Ryan's doing a lot of research on this gizmo. Uh, Ryan, uh, this is going to be kind of a cool thing added to our Patreon uh, and key holder deal, right? Very cool thing. Very cool thing. So, hey, get in now. Uh, and if you do, we'll send you one uh, when we get them. Uh, well, when we get them. I'll just leave it at that. So the cat's still inside the bag a little bit. But, hey, uh, get on over to Patreon.com, search the Meat House. Or just click on the link in the show notes. Uh, hey, what are we drinking tonight? Uh, I usually start this thing off. Ryan, this is your fault again, dude, I swear. Uh, a long time ago, Ryan, uh, you know, I, 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 I've had scotch before, and I've always kind of thought, eh, you know. Uh, I actually prefer my bourbon more than anything. Uh, and uh, Ryan turned me on to this scotch. It was called Valvini, and it was a Caribbean cask, and I thought, my God, this stuff must have been, I mean, this, this stuff was, like, phenomenal. Uh, I couldn't believe what I was drinking, and, uh, wow, I mean, I've, I've gone through, I don't know, probably three or four bottles since Ryan, <laughs> since Ryan t- turned me on to it. Uh, really, I'm not an alcoholic either, believe me, please. Uh, but anyway, so I got a new one, Ryan. I, I don't know if you've had this one yet. Again, from the Balvini, uh, now it's your turn. You got to go get yourself a bottle of this American Oak. Have you had that one yet? I have not. Ah, oh, dude, I'm telling you. Mm. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Oh, my word. Now, traditionally, okay, Scotch is put into barrels. I mean, all, all kinds of barrels, port barrels, brandy barrels, bourbon barrels, usually, uh, you know, uh, from the United States, uh, sourced from the United States. And uh, that's it. 
Well, this one, Ryan, is done in fresh American oak barrels. I thought that was kind of unusual. Now, not knowing a whole lot about scotch, I should probably learn some more. But I, I was I saw this thing on the shelf, and I thought, American oak. And then I started reading the label, and they the, – the, I mean, this is like the real deal, dude. I mean, they're doing it in fresh, raw – American oak barrels. And let me tell you, the flavors, oh, unbelievable. I mean, it's, you know, other than a bourbon that's done in, in American oak barrels where you kind of get a lot of that barrel, uh, that barrel flavor and that char flavor, this is smooth and sweet and oh my God. Uh, you got to try this, uh, uh, Ryan. This is uh, the Balvini American Oak, age 12 years. Uh, this is no joke, dude. Uh, you really got to get a bottle of this. I know Ryan's next, uh, next thing out of his mouth. Well, send me one, right? <laughs> yeah, sure. I heard that. Hey, in my, short, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, in my other hand, uh, in Meat House tradition here, I'm drinking a bracket that I made several years ago. Uh, again, this was talked about on the uh, on the show a long time ago. Uh, this was the Puckerberry Mead. Okay, this is the Puckerberry bracket, uh, the raspberry thing that I made. Mm. Mm. Different. So after a couple of years, the um, hmm, the uh, hmm, let me do that again. Wow! Uh, after a couple of years, the raspberry, the pucker, the pucker level has calmed down uh, quite a bit, actually. Wow. Got to do that again. Wait a minute. Hmm. Oh my! Wow. So, uh, so, so, if I make this again, I have to wait two years to drink it. Is that what this is telling me? <laughs> uh, the pucker point uh, has has diminished. Uh, the raspberry flavor is still there. It's still like a golden ale. It looks more like a pale ale than anything. Uh, it's dry. It's uh, highly carbed uh, still. Um, very dry. I mean, it just makes you want to go after another one. So here it goes. Hmm. Okay. All right. I can do this. I like that. Uh, Puckerberry, a couple of years old. Uh, basically, a, a Ryan Braggot made with some raspberries and about, no, oh, probably three or four pounds of honey. Uh, this is one of the early ones, so the honey went, actually went in at about 100 degrees when it was still on the stove. Uh, I've since changed my method uh, since that point, and I put the honey in during high krausen. I feel that you get a lot more of that honey character. So not a lot of honey character out of the uh, puckerberry, but it still has a, uh, kind of a, uh, an amazing taste, I think. Got a little bit of uh, bitterness to it from uh, the few hops that I put in it. And then, of course, the uh, the pucker, it's there, but it's not as deep as it was. I mean, of course, that's why we call it the puckerberry when, <laughs> when we made it. So, uh, anyway, that's what I'm doing tonight here. Uh, Jeff, what is in your cup tonight? <laughs> well, you know, tonight I am drinking something weird and something wonderful. Uh, JD, did you get weird. your sap house box yet? <laughs> huh? Did you get your sap house box yet? Not yet. Oh, tell me, mine. you got yours? You got yours yeah, before got me. I think I got mine Friday. Oh, um, my God. And you know, if you remember from our conversation with Evan, he said he was going to try and uh, try and slip some cans of that uh, that elderberry draft into our boxes. Yes. yes. My man, Evan, came through. Oh. Um, oh, wow. I am drinking a can of Respect Your Elders. Ooh. It is tart. It is dry. It's bubbly. That's delightful. Um, I when he first mentioned that he had an elderberry draft, I was a little skeptical because elderberry is 
tart and tannic in a way that like there's not a sweet component to it generally from from the elderberry stuff that I've had. Uh, it goes great in stuff that has a lot of sugar in it, like port or like a deep dark red wine um, with a little bit of that that you know the the tannic character that I'm already expecting. But kind of by itself in a draft, I didn't know. Man, this is this is one of the best damn draft meats I've ever had to, to illustrate how good this draft meat is. I put a couple cans in the fridge as soon as I got this and then cracked one after work. Um, this was so good. My wife who hates carbonated beverages stole a can for herself. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> so that's in the one hand, the other hand, the weird hand, this one I picked up at the liquor store the other day. It was on like an end cap, uh, getting clearance off. This is what is this? This is Adelaide's uh, Dreamsicle Wine Cream, dragon fruit flavored. This mm. is the best way I can describe this. Is this is like an Irish cream, except they used some kind of dragon fruit wine instead of whiskey. But obviously, it's some kind of um, fortified wine because the the final ABV is still like fourteen percent. Um, I figured this was getting clear and stuff because it's either weird or terrible and was fully expecting it to be terrible. Um, it's not terrible. It's still weird. It's still weird. The cream and the dragon fruit together are not unpleasant, but um, I, I will still finish this bottle. I'm just not sure what I would do with this. I, I you know, I kind of figured, well, yeah, I might mix this with something or, um, you know, figure out something fun to do with it, but cocktails, yeah, I, <laughs> right. I, you know, I'm, I'm tasting this though. And I'm like, what can I put with this? Cause if I put like a, a really, um, acidic fruit juice with this, um, that's probably going to curdle the cream. If I put like triple sec with it, that might work. Um, spice rum might work, but for the most part, you know, this, I might just finish this straight. Um, I, I can't think of a lot of good co- flavor combinations to go with cream and dragon fruit. And I'm, I'm not sure who came up with the idea of cream and dragon fruit together in the first place. <laughs> so, so, to, so to clear this up, so I got this whole dragon fruit thing wrong because I was thinking about something else. The last time we talked about dragon fruit, now correct me if I'm wrong. Dragon fruit is a little red, um, I don't know, scaly looking. Uh, kind of, yeah. They're they're red fruit with like some green little like. Uh, tenderly scaly looking things poking out of it. When you slice it open, it yeah. to me it looks like uh, like chocolate chip ice cream. It's mostly white fruit yeah. with a ton of tiny little black seeds in it. Yeah, yeah, it looks like a little red hand grenade sitting on the. Yep, <laughs> that's, what, that's that's the one. I, that's okay. <laughs> I don't know. That just popped. Yeah, that's what I, I'm. I'm looking at this thing in my mind because I, obviously I don't have one sitting here in front of me. But I have. You know, the last time I saw one in a store, I thought, man, I, my immediate thought was, that looks like a little red hand grenade. <laughs> so I got you. One of the little pine- I think in World War II, they used to call them pineapples. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> I, <laughs> oh, my God. I, I, we got to move on. Uh, anyway, yep. <laughs> so good stuff, Jeff. Uh, Ryan, uh, you're always good for something either cool or unusual or both in your glass. So what is it tonight? Well, it's it's. I just pulled it out of the fridge, so it's definitely cool, and it's it's also unusual. <laughs> so, our guest tonight, you know, engaged with us when he was he's talking about a braggot, a Ryan Bragg to be specific. So I decided, you know, I, I try to drink along with the uh, with the theme of the show. So I've been I've been drinking Ryan Braggots this evening. And the one I pulled out, I'm going to say it's a Ryan Braggot, but this is a, a Braggot or, that I, I talked about a long time ago. So you guys remember how when I, I made the move to the new Mead House North, um, some, some cases got, got shuffled and some things, some you know, cases got condensed and, and some labeling got, got haywire and it was almost a bottle roulette down there for a little while. <laughs> well, 
we've almost worked our way through that. So, you know, again, we've been doing, doing a lot of good, a lot of good work clearing out the cellar. And, you know, we, I got down and there was a mixed case, but I, I knew what most of it was. And this is the dark sour braggot. So this was the uh, braggot that I cold steeped the grains. So I, I just took the grains, put them in a grain bag, some dark or dark grains in a grain bag, you know, threw them in a bucket of water and, and let them cold steep. And then I uh, soured essentially that, that uh, wort, I guess we'll call it a wort at that point. Uh, and, and, and then, you know, brought to a, so kind of kettle soured and then brought it to a boil, added the honey, you know, the additional malts, that kind of thing. So it's got a really, a really in tart, kind of a tart flavor, but not, you know, not a sweet tart, you know, candy kind of a tartness, just, just a, a really pleasant, clean tartness that plays against the roastiness of the dark grains. Uh, I'm not getting a lot of honey in it. Um, there, there's a little bit of honey, but, but not much at all, which is, I don't, I don't usually get a ton of honey out of my braggots and, and it's drinking quite nicely. It's, it, it's drinking quite nicely. I think there might be a couple more of these down there, but, but then this batch will be exhausted as, uh, as we get more order into the, uh, the cellar room now after, uh, after nearly a year. <laughs> After nearly a year, wow! Uh, very good. Hey, thank you. Uh, guest tonight, as JD mentioned, Greg McNulty, mead maker of three years. He is uh, out of Buffalo, New York, great city of Buffalo. Uh, originally wanted to make beer after graduating with his MBA. You know. What is it? What, what what is it about college students that it seems like? Now he's the second one I think we've talked to. Uh, beer seems to be like a big thing during college. I never went to college, so I never had that. I mean, I you know I went from right from high school to beer, so I miss that whole that whole college beer thing. Uh, so what's with that? Well, JD, you know you're when you're in college and you're young and stupid and living on your own you find those you know beer is is you do a lot of it <laughs> you drink a lot of it i i had a mr beer kit when i was in college and tried go. making a couple of batches with that <laughs> and failed horribly um and i think i made a bat one batch of hard cider and that was even easier and cheaper to make but I mean, I was I was going to college when when beer was. I think you could probably still find really really cheap stuff, but I mean, it was so cheap it wasn't even worth making. You know, it was <laughs> yeah. it was you know seven for you know seven for one night at the bar. You know, kind of a thing. <laughs> uh, uh, introduce our guest. Yeah, I got to get back to this. So it says uh, he wanted to make beer after graduating with an MBA. I assume he meant from home, you know, like a home brewer because, you know, an MBA, you know, you typically a lot of the MBAs I know, uh, you know, get really into the, the profits and, and losses. And, and, uh, I, I don't know too many. I can probably name on one hand. I can name on one hand, the professional brewers that I know personally, who I would say are, are, uh, wealthy or have done, who have created a lot of wealth in it. Uh, I, on the other hand, I've known a lot of professional brewers who've said they know the secret to ending up with a small fortune from owning a brewery. <laughs> and that, of course, is to start with a large fortune. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh -huh. But when he looked at the process and the equipment, he decided it just wasn't worth doing yet. Uh too many bottles, no kegerator, etc. Uh, three years ago, a tree in his yard fruited sour pin cherries, 
uh, in which after some research, he made a dry tart cherry meat. Oh, that's right up my alley. Oh, yeah. Uh, and the rest is history. Uh, he is now in the R&D phase of starting a small meadery in Buffalo, New York, focusing on crushable sessions. Along the way, he found the meat house and decided to give the famous Ryan Braggett a try since now he has the proper equipment. Uh, and that's where we found it. That's where we found Greg. Greg uh, interacted with us on Facebook, I believe, and was asking some questions about putting together a Ryan Braggett. And um, we'll ask him about that shortly. Greg, welcome to the show. Uh, what is in your cup tonight, friend? Yeah, thank you for that lovely introduction. Um, and thanks for having me. So in um, traditional meat house fashion. Are, have, you're welcome. welcome. Welcome to the show. What's, uh, yeah, what yeah, are you drinking sure. tonight? Yeah, so I have two drinks tonight. Uh, first drink is the Pills and Braggett that, um, you know, I Facebook messaged you guys on, you know, some some tips. I've never made a, a, a beer nor a braggot, so um, I wanted to make sure I did it right. And it's uh, made with wildflower honey, which is mostly basswood. It's uh, slightly bitter, and it's got some nice citrus notes because I used um, uh, sa- uh, bitter orange and dried grapefruit peel. Mm. And in my other glass, I have a holiday spiced sizer that I made in June of 2019 that needed a little bit more of aging. Uh, and now it's ready for the holidays. Have, have we done a good job in teaching all these guys when they come on a show, Ryan? I mean, they're, they're all, they all, they all got two, two, two drinks at hand. <laughs> I think we have really educated our listeners pretty well. What do you think? Well, what's the what's the saying? You know, you, a, a teacher is only as good as the the student, or, or, or maybe it's you can lead a horse to water, so, but yeah. a pencil yeah. must be led. I guess no. something, like, yeah. <laughs> um. So, Greg, tell us about uh, you had asked about the uh, how to make the Ryan Braggett. We'd given you some tips. Tell us uh, how that how you ended up deciding how to approach it and and how what the what the result was. Yeah, absolutely. So um, I wanted something very light, and you know, in some of my research, I decided to go with a uh, pill, light pills and malt. Good. I figured, you know, no, no, what the, uh, that's an easy one to play with from from what I've read, and um, I went the extract route. I've never brewed a beer before. I didn't want to start with all grain, except now after this, that's probably my next project from a, from a homebrew perspective. So I uh, went with Pilsen, LME, and some spring water. I used Safe Ale, US 05 Ale use. And I had about, start of the summer with about 60 pounds of raw wildflower honey, down to about 20. I've been brewing up a storm. Um, but I wanted to use that wildflower honey in the braggot. And from listening to the show, I um, added it to the braggot at High Krausen, even though I think I added it a little too early uh, because when I opened it up to check after I added it, it was like triple the size. But it still has a pretty good honey flavor. And the one thing I really wanted to do with this is I wanted it to be bittered a little bit because the wildflower honey that I'm using is mostly basswood. And when you take all the sugar out of basswood, it's really floral and it's almost like slightly minty. So I wanted it to be bitter. So I added bitter orange peel and grapefruit peel to the boil. Uh, I didn't want to use hops to start because I really wanted to taste what a braggot truly is. Um, I know hops are traditionally added to it, but I feel like, you know, to really taste it, you know, the hops might, uh, you know, muddy the waters a little bit. So, but overall, it's, I think it's great. Um, gave it to my wife and a lot of our friends and we had a couple pints of it over the weekend and 
now that I have a kegerator, it's pressurized and, and on tap. Excellent. So you decided, so you, no hops at all. You didn't use any hops at all. Nope. Okay. And when did you put in your, your orange and grapefruit peel? Um, I put them in during the boil. So okay. I, yeah, so I boiled them, um, for, I think about actually, no, 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 actually I'm looking at my notes here. So I boiled for five minutes, I killed the heat, and then I added the citrus peels, and I steeped them for 30 minutes, uh, and then I removed them. So my mistake. And you're getting some, and you're, and you're getting bitterness from those? Uh, a little bit. So I've made some session needs with this particular honey and fermented them dry. And I think that the honey's contributing a little bit of bitterness too, from a taste perspective. Um, I think the bitter orange peel is, and, and grape peel are almost adding a slight sourness to it. Uh, it's nothing unpleasant, but it wasn't what I was expecting. Ryan, um, you know, there, uh, well, I, I want to go back to something you said, um, uh, Greg, w when you're looking at braggots, braggots don't necessarily have to have hops in them. I think that's a big misconception out there. Just because it's beer-like, uh, I guess, uh, if you wanted to, I don't know, Jeff, how is it? We explain it here on the show all the time, harmonious, something that or other. Harmonious marriage or harmonious blend between beer and mead. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And all I mean, there are, there are varieties of mead. I'm sorry, varieties of beer without hops, like grits, things like that. So, yeah, yeah I think you're fine making a braggot without hops. Absolutely, I, I've I've made uh, I've made uh, braggots here uh, in my own little brew house without any hops in them. Uh, and uh, you're perfectly, uh, you know, if you feel so inclined, do it. I mean, there's nothing in the rule book says you have to have you know hops in a braggot. Uh, so, uh, you know. Uh, don't be, uh, you know, don't be confused by that. The other thing, and this is going to be up, uh, I'm going to push Ryan towards this. Um, there's another way to get that citrus taste in your braggots if you're looking for that without having to use uh, orange peel and, and that kind of thing. Ryan, uh, the citra hops... Uh, but done in a completely different way than we're probably used to reading about all the time. Uh, you're you're good at this. You let your hops go in uh, in a uh, what do they call that uh, after the boil uh, hop back, uh, and sometimes you can introduce those hops without introducing a whole lot of bitterness, but still get the flavors right. Yeah, so I. You know, so I call it a hop stand where I, I take the you know, the kettle off the heat, off the fire, and and then drop the hops in. And you know, you are pulling all of the aroma from the hops. And depending on the time that you, depending on the time that. Uh, it's in there and the temperature or the temperature more than the time, I suppose. Mm -hmm. um, you're, you, you know, you might be pulling some bitterness, but in, in, or not depending on again, the, the temperature. And I, yeah, you can get, there's a lot of hops. I mean, citra is just the one that I had the most of, but you can use a lot of hops to pull some of those grapefruit characters or lemon characters or orange fl flavors. A whole host of them. The YET hop that I really like from New Zealand has a little bit of a lime to flavor to it. And and you can do that. And I, I really like that. Um, but as Jeff was saying, you know, Braggot is a harmonious blend of beer and mead. And not all beers have hops. I mean, hops were just one ingredient that's been very popular maybe the last 
700 years or so in, in beer brewing, but beer brewing goes back much farther than 700 years, probably another 20,000 years or so beyond that or more. And so it, you know, they use all kinds of things in, in, um, in there. So different, different, uh, roots and herbs and spices and things like that to give preservative qualities, preservative flavor qualities. Um, so yeah, you can, you can absolutely make a, I would say a braggot without, without hops, but, uh, I enjoy, um, using them. There's a, there's a lot you can get out of hops, um, and other than just the straight bitterness. So, so I, I do like doing that. Um, Greg. And so what, uh, you, you said you, um, that was in one, that was in one paw and in the other paw you had a, I think you said a holiday spice cider or sizer. Tell us about that one. Yeah, sure. So yeah, this is a holiday spice sizer that I started in June of 2019. I bottled it in November of 2019. And this one just uses uh, store-bought clover, honey, uh, organic apple cider. Um, this yeast was k one b one 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 six that champagne yeast. Mm-hmm. And uh, in the primary, I used... Um, oranges and raisins. Um, I didn't think the raisins were going to add nutrients, so I did add, do a staggered nutrient addition, uh, just with some DAP, uh, back then. I didn't know what Fermato was, but, um, I, I made a big batch of that and split that into, uh, a few different, um, secondary, uh, fermenters. Uh, and in this one, I added, uh, a blend of spices and I tried not to go too overboard, uh, with them, um, specifically with cinnamon because I always tend to add too much. So, um, I added some cinnamons, uh, some star anise, clove and cardamom. Mm. Uh, I let those sit for about a week, week and a half. This is a while ago. Uh, and then I removed the spices and stabilized and, uh, back sweetened with just a little cider and uh, put it away. And, and uh, over time, you know, the spices were still really strong. Um, but, uh, you know, now I think that it's it's ready to be uh, drank on a cold night, you know, holiday season. Mm-hmm. It's definitely a sweeter, sweeter sizer. Um, but it's pretty good. Excellent. How, uh, when you came up with your uh, spice combination, how, how did you do that? What, what was your methodology behind that? Yeah, I just kind of Googled around, read a bunch of different forums, and picked apart uh, different recipes uh, to see what spices were in you know, spiced meads uh, or sizers. And I picked the ones that I liked, and then I had to figure out Know, how much of each of them would be good in whatever amount of uh, you know secondary liquid there was? I think I did two two gallon secondary. So um, you know that I always take everything with a grain of salt, uh, especially with spices or things mm-hmm. like cloves, mm-hmm. because um, I was reading, oh, you know, throw two or three cloves in a, in a gallon, and you know, I, I, I reduced it to, to one. And, and I think that was enough. Good, good idea, yeah. Uh, so <laughs> I just kind of hope all you need, yeah. Very conservative with uh, with the measurements, which I, I don't I don't actually have for this one, but figured it was old, old enough that you know, good enough to drink on the show. I've read far too many Facebook posts and forum posts and whatnot. People adding cloves, and yeah, I just toss in a handful of cloves. Uh, <laughs> yeah, well. Uh, kind of comes out tasting like Listerine after a while. I mean, it just, you know, so yeah, clove, that's one, one of them you really got to be kind of careful about. <laughs> so, uh, wow. What was your methodology for adding the cloves to your, uh, sizer? Uh, one of the, one of the common practices is to use like a pre mixed, like a pumpkin spice or an apple spice, apple pie spice, whatever, 
and uh, I've heard of people putting it in like a co- like a paper coffee filter and then stapling it all up and you know much like a tea bag and uh, you know just kind of uh, dosing your your secondary with it a little bit. Uh, how did you approach uh, adding these spices to your sizer? Yeah, if, it, if I were to do it today, I would have done exactly that. Um, but I, uh, I just threw them into the the secondary. So I, I didn't buy any, you know, pre-made or pre-blended, you know, spice mixes. I, I live right next to a place where I can get, you know, bulk spices. So I was able to pick and choose exactly how much each one I wanted. And then I threw them into the secondary and then I actually rewrapped uh, afterwards. Yeah. Well, sounds good to me. <laughs> you know, I mean, uh, yeah, we, we, we talk a lot about, uh, you know, methodology sometimes and, you know, uh, the different ways of doing things. I mean, uh, adding the raw spice into the, into the meat, I mean, that's certainly one, way to do it. In other ways, like I mentioned, uh, you know, putting it in, making you know, your own little tea bag or whatever, and using, you know, like a dry powdered spice or whatever. Uh, but even at that, you can still come up with your own recipe, uh, you know, just by adding the different portions of, you know, different spices, uh, clove and cinnamon and whatnot. Uh, that you want to have in it, uh, I think I, w- I would have added something like an orange peel even uh, into that as well. Uh, nice and wintry. Uh, I don't know, Brian. What, what, what kind of spices do they put in like mulled wines? That, that seems like that might go pretty well in a. Uh, yeah, I. <laughs> I'm I'm blanking a little bit here because I <laughs> it's been a while since I made a mulled wine and. The last time I drank one, I was just trying to keep warm at an outdoor market. So, um, you know, we'll we'll see. But you know, oh, you know, go ahead, Jeff. I was going to say when I mull a wine, I throw in some nutmeg, um, some cinnamon, and usually I'll cut an orange or a lemon in half and poke a ton of cloves into the the cut end of both sides. <laughs> well, that sounds good too. Yeah, what the hell. Yeah, that sounds great. Go ahead, Ryan. So, Greg, you've been making mead for three years. What has what have been some of the the biggest things you've learned, or the aha moments you've had that you'd want other people to know about? Maybe you can save them a little uh, headache or or heartache. Um, you know, if someone's just, just kind of getting started. Oh yeah. If I, if I had a list, um, you know, I, I think number one is, you know, sterilization is by far the most important thing. Um, when I was researching how to do this years ago, uh, you know, I was going to go like the bleach route. And mm. I'm glad I didn't. Good, uh, <laughs> um, good. I, uh, you know, I never, I never got there. Um, I did some experiments. Uh, you know, I think I did like Joe's H and Orange, and I did it, you know, in, with the balloon, and I, I did it that way, and I compared it to the way that I researched how to do it with the sterilization and, and an airlock, and you know, one turned out pretty good after six months, and the other one went down the drain. <laughs> um, I think you can uh, guess which one, <laughs> which one went down the drain. Been there, done that. <laughs> yeah, uh, and, and you know, I've heard about you guys talking on the show a lot about you know, when you first get into this, you you want to crank up the uh, the sugar and you want to see how far the yeast can go. Um, you know, that that's another way to get something that you know it's going to get you buzzed, but. I don't know if it's going to be that great. I mean, <laughs> uh, you know, I did that. Uh, you know, that's why I chose I chose K K one B one 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 six for the sizer because I had so much left. Um, and you know, it's not all about the alcohol percentage. It's about you know what it is you're going for. You know, what your final product. What do you want your final product to be? And how do you back into that? And then, um, you know, what is the yeast going to do to contribute to what? 
you're looking for. Yes, yes, um, yes. It's, there's so many components, and you know, Ken, Ken Schramm's book, uh, that was probably one of the best purchases I have ever made. Uh, you know, I read that thing in two days, and uh, you know, I learned a lot. So, um, you know, just researching and figuring out what you want, making sure everything's clean, and, and uh, you know, asking questions, whether it's forum or Reddit or reading a book or Facebook messaging the meat house. You know, uh, back to the beginning here, uh, when Ryan introduced you, you graduated with an MBA. Uh, what was the MBA in? Uh, just a, ge- a generic, um, you know, master's of business administration. Okay. Uh, my university didn't offer any concentrations in that. And when you were talking about, you know, why do all these college kids want to make, <laughs> want to make beer? <laughs> so, um, you know, I got yeah. my MBA uh, over the course of three years working full time. So I had to go at night. Yeah. And I kind of was dreaming about what are all the things that I want to learn how to do when I have all this time back. And one of them was I want to learn how to barbecue, you know, smoke. Oh, there you I go. Only, and the other one is I want to learn how to make my own alcohol. And, <laughs> and at the time, it was, I was like, I'm not going to distill because I don't want to I don't want to get involved in that. And I'll try to make a hazy IPA and. <laughs> looked into that and that was a little too much, you know, I, I didn't yeah. really have much money and I didn't want to get into that. And then, you know, once uh, I had an abundance of part cherries in my yard, uh, you know, waste not, want not, I had to figure out what to do with them. And it was either make a bunch sure. of jam or make a mead. <laughs> and, uh, and that's how it started. I always figured it. You know, with college kids, it was because they couldn't afford to buy beer, so they figured they could make it on their own. Uh, well, that's true. You're not wrong. <laughs> yeah, so anyway, uh, so uh, – but you decided not to brew beer. You went for mead. Uh, why? why? Why did you choose to go the mead route and not the beer uh, route? Yeah, so a couple, couple reasons why um, – I I had mead from a couple of local um, wineries. They they weren't meaderies, but I think you're you're allowed to make wine and and mead if you have a specific license. Right. Um, You know, I really actually enjoyed a lot of the meads that I had. They were definitely on the sweeter side, but it was different. Um, So it was always in the back of my mind. And then um, it really came about with, you know, that cherry tree in my yard and me trying to figure out what to do with them. Um, and I, I didn't know how to, I didn't know anything. And I, I did a lot of research. Let, let me, let, let, let me stop you right there for a minute, Greg. Sure. Uh, what exactly is a pin cherry? I know it said on the bio you sent pin cherry. What is that? Yeah. Um, I had to figure it out on my own. Um, it is a small, a uh, very tart cherry with a large seed in it and a little uh, little fruit. Um, oh. So, you know, you, you kind of put it in your mouth. You can get the fruit out really quickly and you spit out this big pit. Oh, wow. And I had a tree full of them, like pounds and pounds of them. Okay. And so that was your first... Uh, attempt at making a mead was with these pin cherries? Yeah, correct. I, I harvested all of them uh, and then I uh, took the seeds out and um, I think at the time I, I heated them up gently and then I put them in the freezer kind of made like a juice out of them and I made a five gallon batch of tart cherry mead. I just fermented it dry uh, you know, using that same champagne yeast and I just let it age for six months, and I, I tasted it, and it was it was pretty good. It smelled incredible, but it was a little like, yeasty or bready. Uh-huh. And I was I was a little bummed, but you know I was clear, mm-hmm. and I, I bottled it, and you know then in twelve months it was really good, and then in eighteen months it was so good that I only had a few bottles left, and I was like, damn, I gotta make I gotta make some more of this. You know what? I'm old school. Uh, you know, I mean, there, it seems like sometimes there's such a rush to get it from the fermenter to the bottle. I want to drink it today, now, yesterday. 
Uh, I, you know, I've always been one to, you know, I just put it in a bottle and let it sit or just put the carboy in a closet and just forget it. You know, check the airlock every uh, couple of months or whatever, every month, and just let it roll and, you know, give it some time, let it age. You know, fine wines, uh, you know, will come with a lot of age on them sometimes. So uh, I'm with you there. Uh, before we let you go, though, here, Greg, uh, it says you're doing some R&D uh, on starting a small meadery up there in Buffalo. Uh, and uh, hopefully uh, next June, my wife and I are making a huge trip across country heading to Maine. Uh, we're going to be stopping in New York. But I told her I'm not going to New York City. Uh, I'd rather spend my time up north somewhere. So we may be in the Buffalo area. And uh, I just might give you a call when we get there. Maybe we can hook up for dinner or whatever. But uh, you said uh, in your bio here you're doing some R&D work on uh, starting a meadery. Talk about that a little bit. Uh, where are you and uh, why did you make that choice? Uh, yeah. Um, you know, where, where we are is really, you know, we have went through uh, a lot of different experiments doing a lot of single gallon experiments and taking vigorous notes, um, experimenting with different honeys and different yeasts, uh, even, uh, started experimenting with some of those Kvik yeasts or Kvik yeasts. Yes, 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 yes. Kvik, yeah. Kvik, Kvik. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, <laughs> you know, doing that and, and really what we're looking to do is, you know, I've been doing this for a few years and, um, I like what I drink, what I make. Um, there you go. A lot of people, you know, that's, most important, right? Um, people like what I make and, yeah. um, the decision to kind of start pursuing this and exploring this is really over the summer, uh, you know, last summer, this summer, you know, go out to a barbecue and you see all these people drinking these hard seltzers and mm -hmm. they're not very good. No, they're um, not. No. <laughs> you know, and I, I'm like, you know, I can make a session mead that oh, probably yeah. blows this out of the water. It's probably going to be a little more expensive, but yeah, Let's try and see if we can make things that people like. And um, so far, we have a few different flavors. And what we do is we make make a keg at a time. We roll it into a party with a kegerator, and we say yep. we, have a, a certain, we have a survey monkey that essentially, you know, it's a QR code that you scan and say you can drink as much as you want. Just take the survey and yeah, there you tell go. Me, tell me what you think. Good choice. Um, so we've done that a few times, and uh, it seems like. People are really interested about it, and at the very least, you know, people know what meat is, and there you you'd go. be surprised. People, first question, do you know what meat is? Yep. Fifty percent have no idea. <laughs> so, yep, yep, yep. We'll see what happens with it. Well, uh, Jeff and Ryan, have I left anything out here uh, at all? Uh, what else do we need uh, to get from Greg before we let him go? Uh. Some of his mead shipped to us. <laughs> yeah, there you go. So you got it. Yeah. Get a hold of Ryan. Ryan will get in touch with you about that. Jeff, uh, you anything for Greg? No, I think I'm all set. Good. <laughs> Jeff taking notes. <laughs> <laughs> Just like the he, he's he's like the he's like the secretary of the group. Ryan is our booking agent. And uh, me, I just sit around here and push buttons and uh, produce the damn thing. But anyway, hey, Greg, uh, dude, I'll tell you, we need to have you on again here. Uh, a lot of fun talking to you. And thank you so much for listening to the show and figuring out what a Ryan Braggot is. Uh, I think we pretty, you know, pretty much put the uh, Braggot on the map. Uh, I don't know of any other show that has talked about Braggots as much as we do. And, uh, I guess it's kind of a mission thing we have here at the Mead House about this Braggot thing. Probably one of the most uh, or least uh, uh, made uh, categories of meads. Certainly in the competition level, you don't see hardly any Braggots at all. And so we're trying to push that out there a little bit. Uh, you know, I know some of our listeners get a little annoyed because we constantly talk about Braggots and no other kind of meads. Uh, we try to break it up as much as we can, but uh, again, our mission out here is to, you know, try to get this category of meat out there in the forefront and make people aware. Like you say, I mean, I've I've had the seltzers, I've tried every brand that I can lay my hands on. Some are okay, some are and some are just, 
Sorry, uh, after drinking one, the whole the whole twelve pack just went in the garbage can. Uh, so I hear you on that. Uh, I mean, if you can make a good uh, little brag, little session brag it, you know, something tasty, you know, a little flavor in it, fruit flavor, whatever you want, uh, dude, I'm with you there, man, uh, big time. So, uh, but hey, thanks for hanging out with us tonight here at the house. Love to have you back, my friend. Yeah, anytime. And hey, listen, you have an ambassador in in Buffalo uh, talking about Braggett, so your your mission is is taking root at least somewhere. Very good. Uh, <laughs> we certainly appreciate it. And again, Greg, thanks for uh, stopping by the house tonight. And uh, Ryan will be in touch. <laughs> All right. Thanks, guys. All right, thanks for stopping by. Take care. All right. Uh, I'll tell you what. That was <laughs> that was pretty good. Uh, I tell you, that's um, Greg McNulty out of Buffalo, New York. Now that's not like you know down home New York. That's like way up north. Uh, and uh, I'm serious. When my wife and I uh, head out uh, that way in uh, June, uh, we're going to be staying in New York. And I told her, I said, I, I don't want to stay anywhere in the south. I want to go up up north somewhere and stay up there on our way up to Maine to my sister's place. So. Uh, so, again, uh, Greg, I know you're going to be listening to the show, dude. Uh, I'll, I will give you a holler when we get out your neck of the woods and uh, see if we can hook up and go out to dinner and do something. Maybe try some of uh, I don't know. Does Buffalo have any barbecue up there? Uh, yeah. We'll, <laughs> I think they got, they've got some good wings. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> yeah, I hear good things about the wings. <laughs> yeah, okay. Buffalo Wild Wings coming. Coming your way. Well, I'll tell you what, here at the house, uh, we need to talk about a couple other things here uh, as we move right along. One of them, uh, Jeff, this is going to be in your wheelhouse uh, pretty much, I think, because you, you've had this experience overseas uh, when you were over in Europe, um, this Viking blood. Now, this, this, is a, this is one of my wife's favorite meads, okay? She loves this stuff. And she's had, they make it in different flavors, but she likes the traditional one. And I think you mentioned mm -hmm. uh, pre show, uh, we were talking about our show notes uh, that this is a basically made with hibiscus. Uh, but mm -hmm. this is, this is not, this is, this is not your typical mead that is made quickly and drunk quickly. In other words, this, you, I don't know how it goes. You, like you're drinking your grandfather's mead or something or other. You make mead for your grandchildren or great-grandchildren or whatever. Is that right? Is that how that goes? Yeah. Well, and I, I think that to some extent this is made similar to the Polish style, which that saying goes, you know, you make mead for your children to drink. Um, there is a level of long aging involved in, in some of these uh, – Oh, what do I want to say? There, the, this uh, the Viking blood is uh, Danish, if I'm not mistaken. Yes. And uh, in, instead of Polish, and it's not precisely the same as a Polish mead, but I think it's it's more to that style than you know something that would, you know, like we would think of here, like yeah. a honey one, so to speak. Um, well, and more to the point, um, I think there. are possibly two angles to approach this to i looked at the the question that was written here and they're spelling it viking blood b-l-o-d so i think we're right we're talking about the danish one right but there is also the possibility because for some reason you know we have hydromels and um melomels and if you're having like a um oh god what is it it's a, a mulberry meat is like a, a morat there's all these weird names for um, mead based on like you know, Greek and French and Latin and then somebody decided at some point or another we're going to call cherry meats Viking blood <laughs> it's like a complete disconnect from the rest of the naming convention which yeah. as someone with a background in linguistics just irks the hell out of me but that's my soapbox <laughs> for the moment I think we're talking about the Danish one yeah and yeah so now bear in mind it's been almost a year since the last time I had this um my step brother in law Blaine actually brought some to a Christmas party at uh, uh, you know at that time of year and has for the first time made me not the only person bringing me to a Christmas party. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, if, if I remember right, um, the 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 label says 
you know, it's it's got hibiscus, it's got hops, and it's got spices. And it doesn't yeah. really say what spices are in it. Um, but ginger is kind of it's there. It's very prominent. Um, yes, yes. So I remember that. Um, I, it wouldn't surprise me if there's a little bit of like nutmeg, allspice, or maybe like grains of paradise or something like that in there. Um, there's some earthiness to it that is not just from the hops, although I have a hard time putting my finger on it. With everything going on. So, um, well, and this isn't yeah. a th- 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 this is not a mead where you pour into a wine glass and drink it. I mean, this stuff. No. Uh, the last time I had this is like cordial type. Uh, mm-hmm. Like an after dinner thing, uh, and it's, it's very high in in, in alcohol as well. It's uh, it's sweet and high in alcohol. Very is, sweet, yes. Yeah, it can be a dangerous combination. So, the way I would approach this, I would start by making a hibiscus meat, and I like to do my hibiscus with a boil tea method. Um, you kind of need to be careful here because you can extract a lot of tannin, but I don't think it's going to matter in this case just because there's going to be so many other flavors going on. So um, what I've generally done is uh, around about a, uh, a, a firmly packed cup of the fresh hibiscus leaves per gallon uh, into a tea, and I let that just kind of steep at near boiling for – around about 10 minutes that also sterilizes all the stuff you're probably getting off of those blossoms. So, you know, win, win. Um, yeah, I would go two and a half to three pounds of honey per gallon and hit it with a champagne yeast because this is a high alcohol drink. I think right. the final product is something around the 20% range, close, which we're not going to yeah. get to with yeast alone, yeah. but it doesn't hurt to try. Um, yeah. So I'd use like ec 18 or K1V116 that, that can easily tolerate that uh, that high alcohol level. And, you know, this is this is the time where your, your step feeding and your babying is really going to matter. Yep. Um, in secondary, you know, we're, it's time to talk spices. Uh, would add, like I said, ginger would try kind of the dealer's choice of spice ones as well. Um, like I said – could be allspice, could be you know, some some nutmeg, could be some grains of paradise or some – I could see coriander maybe in there. Um, a little bit, But like yeah. I said, ginger is definitely the most prominent. Uh, as far as the hops go, the hops are not very pronounced. I don't get a lot of bitterness. I get some earthiness. And um, that makes me think probably maybe like dry hopping about a half an ounce of something like Fuggles, um, which is just a basic British hop. Uh you could also try like a German Haller Tower or um, Tetang, something like that. Um, something in that noble family that would be easily accessible in, in Denmark. And it gives you a little bit more of that earthy slash floral care. What, uh, uh, when, when, you know, when it comes to, I mean, this is, uh, you, you know, like you mentioned, this is something you, you know, you're you're drinking the mead that your grandparents made, or you're making right. the mead that you're. you're there is an aging component to this as well. Yeah, so talk about that a little bit. I mean, and and what yeah. kind of vessels? I mean, I, this this may relate more to Polish meads than anything than the Danish mead. Uh, I'm not quite sure where the separation is, but uh, what sort of vessels? was uh, our Polish meads typically aged in, and are we just talking about glass? I mean, I, I'm not qu- quite sure what direction I would so go So that's here. a good question. Um, there is definitely some micro-oxidization or some more than micro-oxidization going on in the Dansk Mjod. Uh, uh, yes, and, I, and, and uh, let me interrupt a minute. I, I, you know, when, when Raven and I – you know, uh, pour a little cordial glass of this Viking blood uh, that she likes so much. Uh, there's a very, almost a sherry cognac like uh, taste to it. Okay, mm-hmm. very much so. It's been speculated in a couple of different places that 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 they do a long age on like Madeira uh, sherry bottle or sherry casks. Mm. Um, in order to, to get that flavor through. It wouldn't surprise me. Wow. Uh, I do know that they have to fortify it somehow or another because like if final ABV on that is like 19, 20%, Very it's pretty high. strong. Yep. And 
I I don't know if people can commercially get that level of uh, uh, alcohol content reliably. Um, it's hard. <laughs> it may be that. possible. Yeah, it's possible, it's but it's problem, very so. hard. Yeah. Yeah, my guess very, is they probably fortify it with something. Yeah, and so my my pro tip here, um, honestly, rather than doing a long age in an oak barrel or something like that, I would stick some um, some medium medium plus French oak on it, and then I would fortify with sherry. There you go. Um, that'll give you the the that characteristic micro oxidization, and uh, you know bump up your alcohol content at the same time. So two for one there. That's how I would do it. Yeah. And so, I mean, I'm 67. So my kids would be like, what, in their 50s, 40s? <laughs> so what? If, <laughs> so we're talking about how many years here of aging? Nah. Uh, I think we're looking probably to do something. Little, yeah. So, uh, you know, just fortify it with a little bit of sherry, throw some wood in it, try to speed that, you know, 25 or 30 years up a little bit. Uh, would probably help, but, uh, uh, good stuff. Uh, Jeff, I know, um, you know, we, we could probably spend another 15, 20 minutes on this topic because, uh, it's something I I wouldn't mind attempting. Uh, and, uh, you know, I've done the two port mead projects, which were intense, as all get out. I mean, uh, you know, like I say, I mean, these are high ABV meads. These are pushing, you know, 19 and a half percent. And it took a little bit of work to get it up there. I mean, you got to coax it. I mean, you're dealing with a yeast that's only tolerant up to say 16, 17%, maybe 18%. And you're trying to get it just a little bit more. And uh, so that was quite the doings uh, in order to do that. I wouldn't mind trying to do a batch of this Vikings blood. Uh, I quite enjoy it. My wife and I do on occasion after dinner uh, uh, and uh, as a dessert, uh, you know, you know, instead of, you know, a big fat slice of apple pie or cherry pie, we'll sit and have a little cordial of uh, uh, an after dinner drink. And uh, that kind of hits the spot a little bit. So uh, good mm-hmm. stuff. Um, the next, uh, our next discussion here in segment two, uh, I'm going to throw this actually over towards, uh, well, and Jeff, you can chime in here on this too, because I think this is both your wheelhouses actually. Uh, Ryan, the whole thing comes from, uh, uh the Mead Recipes Facebook, uh, and I'll read it verbatim. I got into a discussion this weekend with a self-proclaimed mead snob. I asked several questions and, uh, he did seem to know the science behind fermentation that said, he was trying to determine what I used to flavor my traditional mead. That led to this question. Do you pasteurize your honey before you use it? Why? Why not? I personally do 170 degrees for 10 minutes, then down to below 80 as quickly as I can. This kills off any wild yeast that may be lurking in the honey, preventing pesky off flavors now we have had mead makers home mead makers come on the show and talk about you know screw the the package yeast you don't need any of that uh just you know uh, let your honey come to ferment on its own and produce some really awesome tasting mead so what's the deal here pasteurizing honey is that uh is that a big deal i mean are we really killing all the all the off flavors uh, by doing that well, you're killing flavors. I'll tell you that. You know, you get above, you get above a hundred, and yeah, there's some debate, but let's say 105, 110, 115, you're going to start to really burn off a lot of the really delicate aromatics that make those honeys special. You know, when you when you go to the, the grocery store and you buy your plastic honey bear or you buy something that is uh, processed honey and honey might be generous considering you see some reports about the uh, the forged honey uh not foraged honey but foraged honey is is that it's you know it's really processed and and it's kind of just all the all the um 
again, the, the really delicate aromatics, the really nice things that make a nice varietal, all the, the reason you're going to pay big bucks for them there can really get, um, can really get destroyed at, at high heat. Yeah. So, uh, I, I don't now if he's worried about wild yeast, keep in mind that any commercial yeast is going to outcompete, you know, if pitched at the appropriate rate, is going to outcompete anything wild in there, any of the wild yeast that are yeah. in there. The you know the the K one V, you know, the is a killer strain. I mean that that is a strain that will not only outcompete the other wild yeast that are in there, but will actively seek to destroy any other yeasts that are in that in that uh, that must or that wort um, out there. So no, I I don't um, pasteurize my honey. I don't want to destroy the delicate aromatics and delicate flavors of it, and. If I, I'm pitching a commercial yeast, it is going to not have any problem suppressing any of the uh, wild, the the small amount of wild yeast that that might be in there. Um, but JD, you do you know you can absolutely we we talk about it all the time of uh, people accidentally you know make mead by. You know, diluting diluting some honey in water and and seeing it take off. So yeah. you, you absolutely, uh, um, you know, can can do some of that. Uh, Jeff, what what is our what does our man of science think about think <laughs> about that uh, that kind of thing? Are you guys familiar with the term hydrophilic? No. Come Basically, on, dude. I'm 70 years, almost 70 years old. What the hell is that? <laughs> it's Greek. It, Greek. Uh, essentially, it means water loving. <laughs> and um, are you guys are aware that they have found honey in like ancient Egyptian tombs. Oh, I've like, read that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah three, yeah. four thousand years old. It's crystallized as all get out, yeah. but it's still fine. There's a reason for that. Honey is when it's when it's in its honey state. It's said that. That 17, 18 percent uh, uh, water content, it's so saturated with sugar, the sugar literally cannot get enough water. Um, the reason that honey is basically unable to spoil, the reason that we have these anecdotal like descriptions of like Aboriginal or pre-industrial societies using it as a kind of an antiseptic balm for wounds and stuff mm -hmm. is because – Literally, it will suck the water out of bacteria or um, uh, yeasts and other kind of microflora and stuff like that. Uh, it is not hospitable to other microbes. Uh, so really, the amount of yeast surviving in or on that, tiny. Once you get a good like starting colony of yeast, whether it's lab-grown or, you know, if you've got a particularly, you know, um, prevalent strain locally that can get in there and take off once you've diluted it to the point where it doesn't just want to suck up every like every last little molecule of water. It's going to go. Mm -hmm. um, you're you really don't have to worry about the yeast or other microbes in the honey. It's anything that can get in there after the fact that you really have to watch out for. And so, if you've got a good starting colony, like Ryan said, that K one V one one six. Um, kind of a barbaric yeast <laughs> a barbaric yeast that goes after everything else <laughs> yeah it's it's kind of the mongol horde of, uh, <laughs> of, of of yeast it'll just sweep through and burn everything and conquer everything and leave a pile of skulls in its way well, what, was that, what was that movie with Russell Crowe the, I mean, this is what we're talking like way back in the Kings and Queens Hotel what movie was that he the played this gladiator movie. gladiator <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> oh my God. Okay, so I'm going off on a different thing. So okay, so that's what the kind of yeah we're talking about barbaric yeast that just overtakes and just you know uh, wins at all costs. 
Let me let me ask yeah. you this from another perspective, okay? And I'm coming from the angle of the competition and the BJCP, the guidelines and all that. Uh, one of the things that uh, I know that judges look at is honey characteristics. Mm-hmm. Now, Ryan said that, you know, by taking the temperature up on your honey to such a high degree, uh, you run the risk of uh, pretty much eliminating a lot of that. Yeah. So They're- from a judge's standpoint, I mean – would you take your honey up to 170 degrees just to, I mean, isn't that a risk when you're talking about competitions? <laughs> the only time I've ever taken my honey anywhere near that temperature is making a boche. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, and that's, uh, I mean, Flat yeah, out. okay, I get that, yeah. There, there's a reason they call them very volatile aromatics. They're volatile. They're delicate. And heat can drive those off really easily. So no, I, I generally don't mess with that. I want to preserve as much of that, especially the aroma. Um, that that's something you could lose by heat. So no, I don't mess with that. KV one, one six, the gladiator of yeast. How's, how's that? For- <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, I think we pretty much talked that to death. Let's get on to some Facebook friends. I, lo- I love this part of the show. Uh, and, uh, of course, this is where we uh, answer questions from a lot of uh, – just a ton of meat makers out there that just post stuff everywhere, Facebook, Reddit, you name it. Uh, and uh, we tend to try to answer these questions based on no formal expertise other than what the three of us have experienced in our own damn brew house. So here we go. Uh, leftovers from last week, guys. Um Starting off from the top, this is my first time stabilizing. And let me know if we've covered this already because I tend to forget things. That's a luxury of being old. Uh, you can you can you can forget things and nobody can hold you to it. Uh, so this is my first time stabilizing and back sweetening. Use 550 milligrams of K Meta and a half teaspoon of K Sorbate per gallon. 48 hours ago, is that enough? I don't have a pH or free SO2 measurement. No sulfites added up front either. Just fruit, pectic enzyme, honey, water, and 71B when I added honey to sweeten. Should I heat it to a certain point? This may be two questions rolled into one. Uh, when, I, when, when I add the honey to sweeten, should I heat it to a certain point first to kill any wild yeast or just add my, more case or bait? Jeff? Um, stab. So, second question first. See my last answer? No, you're good. Uh, don't even bother adding more case sorbate because you're you're going to be fine. Um, I so I I freely admit that I don't generally do the pH and free SO2 measurements. I don't have the the tools to do that. They're kind of expensive, and I'm a little lazy and a little bit a uh, bit of a miser in that regard. Um, so I follow the rule of thumb of, you know, half a teaspoon of, uh, K sorb per gallon and half a teaspoon of, uh, the K meta per five or six gallons and generally call that good. Uh, I have no idea what 550, uh, milligrams translate to in terms of volume, but yeah, no, if you're following package directions, you're probably fine. Um, yeah. so I would go ahead and back sweeten, get to where you want it and you're probably good to go. Good deal. Uh, Ryan, I'm going to ask you about uh, D47. Question on D47. I know it requires temperature control during fermentation more uh, uh, more than many others do. If ambient temps in my basement remain in the mid-60s or lower, is that a safe place to ferment uh, using 47? Or does it require an even cooler controlled temperature environment? I'm going to go right off the top and say no, but uh, Ryan, uh, what's your take on that one? D47. Ooh, it's, it's like we're having a quiz show and we're trying to, you know, what the, uh. who's the yeast, what's the temperature? <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, I, I might be a tad bit cool, might be a, a couple of degrees chilly at 63 down there, but it, uh, I know you, some of that, that yeast can be a little finicky. And you definitely want to 
um, you know, keep it in that, in that recommended temperature range to keep it happy and, and, um, and not throwing any, any off flavors, but yeah, that's about, that's, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm going to say, it, I think you're, you're probably pretty close. My, uh, my dealings with D47 was that I started it off at a higher temperature, uh, probably something around 72, 74 degrees. And then as it got going, slowly bring that temperature down, say a couple of degrees every few hours or so uh, to get to the, uh, you know, this is before you want to get to that quote unquote high Krausen level or point in your fermentation, but uh, slowly drop the temperature. I, I, I don't know that I would – you might run into trouble trying to get it started that low of temperature, Jeff. Uh, I don't know, but uh, at least that's my take on it. Yeah, and I, you know, D47 is one of that I started out using almost exclusively, and I kind of transitioned to a bunch of other varieties shortly after or shortly before. I can't remember exactly which, but when I started out on the show um, – I, I think I've. They say D forty sevens like ideal range is sixty to sixty eight Fahrenheit, and I think I've pretty much stayed in that mainly by again being a penny pinching bastard and uh, mostly fermenting in winter months. So you know yeah. when the house is in the sixty six to sixty eight degree range in the first place, and that's the ambient temperature. I didn't really get a lot of off flavors there, but yeah. you know, if I had tried that in the summer, it might have been a different story altogether. Um, I was, yeah, it, it's, go ahead. Um, I, to be honest with you, I don't remember how easily it took off to answer your question as far as uh, you know, uh, like starting at a lower temperature, but. Um, that's that's a pretty comfortable range for it, and it had been a consistent workhorse for me the, the times that I used it. So I don't think you're going to have too much trouble with me at uh, you know 63 to 68 degree basement. I think it's going to be just fine. Yeah, 68 was seemed to be my kind of uh, that was kind of the most stable temperature range for D47. I thought uh, mm-hmm. in uh, my brew house when I when I used D47. Uh, it's kind of the upper limit, and I think if you go a little above that for a limited period of time, you're not going to see a terrible amount of yeah. off flavor. But yeah, uh, I'm going to bypass the next one, guys. I'm sure you can read that in the show notes. Uh, you'll understand why when you read the question. Let's skip down to the next one. <laughs> has, everyone, has anyone reduced a mead to a syrup or a sauce? I'll answer this one. Mm-hmm. Yes, I have twice. Uh, I, I took a, uh, it was actually a commercial mead. Uh, I want to say it was a, either a raspberry or something plum based. I don't recall. Uh, it was a commercial mead and I was doing a pork roast and I put this mead in a little saucepan and I reduced it down almost, uh, almost half, a little more than half actually. And uh, I put a little knob. By this point, I'm prob- I probably have maybe a half a cup of mead left in the saucepan. I added a little dab of butter, maybe a couple of tablespoons, and uh, took it off the heat. And uh, you want to get a whisk and just whisk that butter in. You don't want it over the, over the fire. You just want it to, to melt and, and combine very nicely. And what that does is makes a nice, nice, uh, very nice sauce, okay? And after I'd done that, I had basted this pork roast with this berry. I don't, I don't remember what berry it was. I, I, off the top of my if head. If I remember right, it was like a blackberry, black cherry, and yes, yes, uh, yes, something yes, else yes. black, like black currant maybe. Yes, uh, yes. And you're, yeah, you're exactly right. And... I basted this pork roast in it, and my God, oh, that was just unbelievable. Uh, the second one that I did actually came from Sap House, uh, 
and bless his heart, uh, Ash Fishbein was kind enough to send me the very last bottle of the uh, Mirepoix mead uh, that they had made uh, years ago. And I took uh, probably, it was in a 375 bottle, 375 milliliter bottle. I took about half of that bottle, a little more than half that bottle. And again, I put it in a saucepan. Now, this mirepoix mead is made, if you know what a mirepoix is, okay, you'll understand what this mead is made of, okay? Uh, onions, carrots, celery, the whole nine yards. And so I took this meat and I put it in a saucepan and I reduced it down and made a sauce out of it. Oh, my God, it was so good. I don't remember what I cooked with it, the chicken or something, but oh, my Lord. Uh, so absolutely, if you've got a nice berry mead uh, or uh, something along that line, absolutely put it in a saucepan. Uh, you know, get it to a very rolling boil. You want as high heat as you can get and uh, reduce that sauce down. And you can do, you can, actually you can do a number of things when you get it to the point where you like it. And like I did, add a couple of doublets of uh, butter to it. Uh, makes a nice, real rich uh, sauce or a baste. Or you can add a little bit of cream to it. Uh, and uh, use that as a sauce as well. So absolutely, I have taken a mead and made a sauce out of it. Uh, Ryan, have you done anything like that before at all? Uh, I haven't reduced mead down into a sauce, but I've done. I have, I have cooked with it. I've um, used it as a brine before uh, okay. or a marinade. Um, okay. And done that a few times. And I've also cooked a little bit into risotto. So Ooh, I was, yeah. I like making that's a risotto. A and and I have used a little bit in that as well. So so I, I have absolutely cooked with me and I, I think that there's a lot you can do with it. But um, you you definitely um, yeah, I, I I'd say there's there's a lot you can do to cook with meat, and you should definitely take advantage of it. Jeff, have you ever uh, gone down this road with your uh, meads or anybody else's meads for that matter? I have not reduced to syrup, much like Ryan, although I will tell you one of my favorite uh, mead-related cooking adventures. I took, um, if I remember right, I took a, like, just made a little bed of cauliflower florets and put a pork loin on top of those, nicely seasoned, mm. and then poured in about a, I want to say about a half of a 750 milliliter of some eh, okay, traditional that I had lying around from one of my early projects. Sure. And just kind of let that pork loin poach in that. Uh, the The amount of liquid was barely up to the surface of the meat, but you put the the lid on the roasting pan and let that steam kind of coalesce around it as it's cooking. Yep. Um, let the, the juices from the pork go into the mead and let all of those get into the cauliflower. Ooh. That was something special. Oh yeah. Yeah. They call that braising. Uh, I do that quite a bit here with, uh, short ribs and, uh, once in a while I'll take a, uh, a chuck roast and, uh, use some of the stout that I've made in, a pa in the past. I just pour me a big old glass of it. Uh, out of the uh, kegerator and, uh, you know, usually about, oh, 14, 16 ounces or so uh, into my pork roast, uh, into my, uh, well, actually, I'm in an old process. I'll, may, maybe I'll put the per recipe up sometime, but it's pretty easy. I apologize to our listeners for using the wrong term there. <laughs> yeah, well, it's okay. I mean, hey, it's, uh, you know, uh, you can do it with any liquid. I mean, a lot of people use wine for doing their mm -hmm. uh short ribs and what braising and whatnot you can use pretty much any liquid you want uh provided that you know it has the kind of flavors you're looking for i, I wouldn't mind you know taking like a berry based mead and throwing that in i mean you know you I mean people use wines i mean like a cabernet or merlot uh something on the heavier side fruity you get those fruity mm -hmm. flavors and everything uh what about taking like a fruity uh a fruity mead 
And uh, I'm yep. talking dark berries and uh, reducing that down with your onions and carrots and whatnot and your braising liquid, adding your beef stock and, and everything. Oh, my God. You're making me hungry now, dude. Come on. Well, I think if you're going to go that route, you almost got to, like, stick an immersion blender in that and make a berry and, like, onions and peppers Absolutely. and stuff like that sauce. Absolutely. Slice that meat up and pour <laughs> over it. Now I'm now I'm drooling a little too, so yeah. let's let's yeah. move on before we get to <laughs> get to torturing ourselves here. Yeah, okay. I think we're gonna drop it right there. Uh, I'll tell you what, I am getting hungry. I, I didn't. I, I usually I try to eat something before the show. Uh, I didn't this time, uh, so shame on me. But I'll tell you <laughs> what, uh, we did have a good time tonight, and. Uh, my lord uh i'll tell you what you know what uh, thanks for uh, listening uh tonight here to the meat house and to greg mcnulty uh, dude uh, you need to come back on this show and we say that so many times brian uh to some of our guests uh and uh we certainly look forward to having them back here right absolutely you know, uh, Greg, uh, you know, best of luck to you up there in Buffalo, New York, uh, with your uh, meadery. And, uh, you know, once again, uh, you know, when we get out your way, why, we'll certainly give you a call. And uh, maybe we can do dinner or, uh, or at least something, at least meet up somehow. Hope this COVID thing goes away to the point where we can actually act, you know, actually go out and go face to face with people for once. Uh, that would be a nice thing. But, hey, yeah, thanks for hanging out with us in this episode. And, hey, don't forget, let us know what you're brewing. All you got to do is email us, info at themeathouse.com, or do the message thing like Greg did on Facebook or Twitter, both at The Mead House. So, hey, in the meantime, happy mead making. That's it for this episode. Ryan, flip the lights off. Jeff, slam the door shut and lock her up. Hey, we'll be back next week with episode, what is it, 177, something like that. We did 176 tonight, 177, 177. 177. hey, next week, hey, we're gone.